Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. It's lovely to be here, and thank you, Evan, for that lovely introduction. Uh, I'm going to read a few uh, new poems and a few from uh, my book, The Sinking Road. I'm going to start with a short poem called Honesty. And as a hint, it's about the, uh, the flower honesty rather than the thing itself. Uh, honesty. It was a 70s thing, a fad that every housewife kept for show, the aspidistra of the working classes. She let me dust the petals while she slept off her migraine, Judas money. I held my breath and brushed drab kisses across each brittle window. Never once popped my finger through the tempting membrane, honesty. You think you've seen the last of it, then it ghosts an old folks home, or the day room of a slated hospital, Lunaria Rediviva, paper moons. I find a spray done up with peacock feathers in an Alston B&B &B and hold my breath again. It seems to stand for the little she aspired to, the less she was allowed for all the mindless tasks she found to keep me occupied. Petal after petal gives between my thumb and forefinger. And uh, I'm going to read another poem about childhood. I should warn you that this one goes over the page. But you're all still here, so that's a very good sign. This is called Brother Cole. Um, when I was little, I used to, uh, uh, I, uh, I used to run around. I was a naughty ban, and I used to hide in the coal bunker. Every house in in our street had a coal bunker. So this is about um, that. So if you get lost in the poem. Uh, I'm probably just describing the inside of the coal bunker. So you can keep coming back to that point. I think I wanted to see how long I could keep it going with me in this little space. Brother Coal. Childhood fantasies, the kind that die hard, staged in the darkness of the coal shed. A mother's boy knuckling down for a shift of glamorous, imaginary graft, the difficult one, ideas below his station, a could-be diamond lacking in ambition. And there you are as always, there you are, playmate, shadow, secret sharer, genius loci of the bunker, fast asleep like a tramp wrapped tight in a dirty oil cape. From back-to-backs that echo with raised voices to row against row of little Dutch-style houses, the wreck, the tip, the corner shop, the street, a warren of cul-de-sacs, my earthly estate. Except I never liked to play outside. Scholarly, timid, anxious to succeed. First chance I got, I left it all behind. And then, I couldn't help myself, returned. Sooner than I would dare admit, I sensed that this is all I stay buoyed up against. My childish heart sinks like a falling flare. Dad asks if he is making himself clear, no pets allowed. In this house, all the warmth we can afford is right there in the hearth, where you cringe on your haunches in the cree or spatter awake in wet coughs and outcry. You drowse open-eyed. You settle and resettle as a dog curled in its basket might shift a little, lift its muzzle to salute a ghost, and then, sigh of the disregarded, resume its rest. A black cabinet painted shut, the spellbound doors promising untold tinctures and liqueurs. A miser's hoard, a treasure trove, 
cool to the touch, though never as cold as the spent white ash he had to rake out last thing every night. He too was cold, he too was spent and white. I see him on his knees as though in prayer, huffing and puffing life into the fire. I see him rise, the cupped flare of a match, like sudden anger. He too was quick to catch. Fibred, veined, fissured like an icicle, black pleated muscle ripped with black blood crystal. It stranged my mind that I could never lift a shovelful or lug a sack, the heft. So much unmanageable worldliness overmatching me, and yet a single piece felt buoyant, quick and subtle, easily born. Before such mysteries, I hunker down in contemplation. I turn and burn in claustral darkness. I found a church of one. Implicit as the fault in a flawed prism or the seamless ambiguity of a poem, your darker promise to give nothing away, to make us pay for everything, to someday run out on us, that we might balance the cost of losing you against all that was lost when you were found, hung in your galleries, entombed within yourself, far from the sun's rays. A fluted curtain, no wind stirs, sails of wet leather, a black ship in black waters. Compacted sentiment, this pseudo-factual, homely, far-fetched stuff. O oh, Brother Cole, shine your black torch on such complacency for shame. Shine your black torch that I may see each brush off cave in and betrayal implicated in your comet's tail. O oh, stardust of disasters and diseases, child labour, roof collapse and silicosis, let me stand face to face with your dark mirror until the shadows glitter and grow clear. Um, so as you have probably gathered from my accent and poems, uh, I grew up in Northumberland. Uh, I want to read one more poem uh, about that area, about its history, and this is called Pit Ponies. I was doing some work in a school um, last week and I decided to read this poem and at the last minute I thought I better just check so I said does, does everyone know what pit ponies were and so one hand went up one girl knew so, so I had to quickly explain about these little Shetland ponies working underground so of course I totally lost my audience because everyone's sort of weeping for these ponies as poor ponies and well, well yeah but I'm sort of using them as a metaphor, but that, that, that didn't help. Um, so briefly, I will say that this is about the time when, when ponies would be stabled underground. They would only come up maybe two days a year for Christmas and for, the, for a miner's holiday. But they would also be brought up, I mean in the cages, that the miners used. <clears throat> They'd be brought up if there was a strike that went on more than a couple of days. So, um, and when the ponies were brought up from the mine, all of the, the local people would gather around to see it because this was a, it was a sight to behold. The, the ponies, they'd been underground for months, so they'd go, they'd go nuts and they'd sort of charge around the field because they'd be stunned and blinded by the sun. And uh, it was, I don't know what they made of it, I don't know if it was entertaining or what, but um, that's what this is about, one of those occasions, pit ponies. Listen, they're singing in your other life, faith of our fathers, sounding clear as day from the pit head where half the village has turned out to hear the latest news from underground. News that will be brought to them by the caged ponies, hauled up and loosed 
in Raph Smith's field. Could that have been you in Raph Smith's field, mouthing the words and listening to the cages lift, watching sunlight break on dirty ponies, noting the way unshoed for their big day, each one flinches on the treacherous ground, pauses and sniffs, then rears and blunders about. As at a starting pistol, they gallop out and a roll of thunder takes hold of the field. Thunder, or else an endless round of cannon fire. <coughs> Hooves plunge and lift. They pitch themselves headlong into the day. Runty, fabulously stubborn pit ponies. But they seem to have a sense, the ponies, a sidelong kind of sense about getting called in at last light on the fifth day. They seem to know the strike has failed, as though they felt the tug of their old lives. They shy and shake their heads. They paw the ground. Let's leave them there for now, holding their ground for all it's worth, and say the ponies might maintain their standoff as the livid shades of miners might yet stagger out of history into the pitched field dotted with cannonballs you see today. Let's pretend you might come back someday to wait a lifetime on this scrap of ground until the silence, like the silence of a field after a battle, breaks and you hear ponies buck and whinny as the chains pay out and once again the rusty cages lift. As though the day was won, as though the ground was given, the ponies gallop out to claim their piece of field, their only life. That was a Sestina. I didn't give you advance warning. It has been known to empty a room, the word Sestina. Um, I'm going to read something a bit different now. Uh, I also I translate quite a bit. So um, this is a short translation from part of uh, the Irish epic poem about King Sweeney who, um, for insulting a cleric, Ronan, who became Saint Ronan, uh, he, was, he was turned into a bird. And this is uh, the most famous bit of his story, I suppose, um, and I've called it Sweeney in the Trees. And it's just the mad King Sweeney, having been turned into a bird, talking about his new life out in the wilderness, among the trees. Sweeney in the trees. When I hear the belling of the stag in the glen, my heart begins to pine and keen. Acorns taste as sweet as ever, and I still savour the hazel's coffer. But unmet lust and unseasoned grief mar a man's life when his home is lost. Silver birch waltz in the wind that scatters aspen leaves like staves in a battle. Apple tree apt to be looted by boys, weather the storm with the rowan blossom. Alder, shield me with your pallid branches. Blackthorn, bless me with blood dark sloes. Ivy, hold yourself close as a halter, you stand too at odds with the world. Holly, be a shelter from the wind, a barrier. Ash, be a spear shaft hurled by a warrior. Dearly it cost me to cross you, briar, a scald of blood money, my palm in bloom. Hateful to me as an evil word, a rootless tree holding sway in the wood.
I'll read another one um, about a tree. This is about uh, a tree that's been struck by lightning and it's called Secret Papers. I stole the title from Thomas Transtromer, um, though I do acknowledge it in my, I think I do, I do, thank God I do, in the back of the book. Secret papers. Something has splayed the oak trunk in a dozen knotted tongues. Nobody heard the sound it made. Would its song, pure air and fire, have split the ear? Or might a tree slip from its bark quietly as a girl steps from her clothes to stand stripped to the skin, secret papers burnt? Everything conspired, a singling out occurred. Um, I'll just read two more poems. This is quite a recent one, so it's the first time I'm reading this. The Tawny Owl. There was this owl. I used to see him perched on his branch in the not yet dusk, poised like a diver taking his time. I'd look out from my attic room. I'd look up from the dishes. There he'd be, weighing his options. Then suddenly let fall himself in a low glide the length of the terraced garden, bob over the churchyard wall, and be gone. His flight was silent, silencing, his disappearance had the force of apprehension. Never saw a kill, never saw a mouse limp in his beak, though I remember it. Was not, as I once thought I'd be, brushed by his wing. Uh, and I will finish with a poem called To a Harver. A harver is a, is a uh, half brick. So this poem is uh, someone who's sort of ad addressing a half brick, um, as in the kind of thing that gets thrown in a riot. So the poem is about that, about sort of antisocial behavior. Um, it's, it's possible uses as well as abuses. To a harver. O oh, harver, O oh, haffer, O oh, half brick, your battened down century of faithful service in a pit village terrace, forgotten now, you've broken loose. Now you're at large on CCTV, flackering out of kilter till you bounce like far flung hail rebounding off the riot squad, or kissing the away support a fond goodbye or anyhow let fly, as fifty years ago someone aimed you at my father's skull, while he was being shepherded down Rutherglen Road, when it was raining bottles, when it was raining hammers and nails, after an old firm fixture, the decider, I exist because you missed and broke his collarbone. I weigh you now against the good you've done. St. George's Hill, when Cromwell's cavalry advance, we find you, or your country cousins, apt and good, versatile in the hands of the true levellers. Now Banksy has a laugh, replacing you with flowers. And what about your bit part in that dockyard standoff? The gates swing to, the scabs clock on. As to the nitty gritty of whose side you're on, you stay as they stay, you stay as they say, ahead of the curve. 
But you were there at Peterloo and you were there at Brixton. You were all the rage in Meadowell. Your ancestors were with us in the cave, before the wheel, before the fire, and ever since we've never been without you. All our high designs can be reduced to you. You stand for stunted hope, grown wild among the backyard odds and sods, where the snubbed toaster and the jilted BMX jockey for position with the unacknowledged honesty. O oh, root and seed of boxed in lives, O oh, token of descent, how often have I seen you in the thick of it and raised my arm against you? On pitted tarmac by the gutted community centres of besieged estates, born as a gift or hurled down like a prophecy, I've seen you taken up, and even in the playground, hidden in a snowball, you followed hard upon. You've come a long way from the clay pit, worked out and abandoned, a long way from the vanished kilns of Langley and Eldon. Here, let me launch you on another posthumous career, earthbound comet, stub of destiny, throwback. I have a soft spot for you, so go on, make something happen. O oh, Claude, O oh, totem of the unaccommodated, O oh, Harvard, History's ellipsis point, sign to which we must attend. When words fail, may you always be at hand. Thank you for listening. <laughs>